So I want to start today with a question, and it's a question I've been mulling around with two of my girlfriends for several weeks. The question is, when does a person qualify to be old? <laughs> so we're going to have a show of hands on this one. How many of you would say you're relatively young? Raise your hands. Okay, now, how many of you would say you're pretty old? Raise your hands, be proud with it. For those of you who did not participate or raise your hand, that means you're old. <laughs> so, how old you are kind of depends on your perspective, doesn't it? I mean, I know when I was 16, I thought 30 was death. And just a couple weeks ago, I turned 50, and I think 30's pretty darn young. But probably the youngest man I ever met was my Uncle Rudolph. And the last time I saw him, I was about 12, and it was his 100th birthday. Uncle Rudolph fascinated me because he refused to accept that even at 100, society would deem him as old. He didn't believe he was. In fact, just after his 100th birthday, he moved out of the nursing home that he'd lived in, back to his hometown, and started living alone. Why did he move out? Because the nursing home staff would not let him go outside to see the snow or eat bacon because he was too old. But the one thing I will never forget is on his 100th birthday, I was young, and I remember this today. Rudolph came and he said to me, he got right in my face, and he said, Holly, never ever be afraid to tell people your age. Be gracious for every year God has given you. For if you refuse to tell or embarrass to tell people your age, you are actually slamming, and he said the word slamming, and disrespecting every year of life God has given you. That is why to this day, if someone tells me how old I am, I'm going to say I just turned 50. Rudolph believed that the secret to a long life was pray every day, read the Bible every day, and never, ever, ever believe you're old. He, get, he gave and embodied the words, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he preached, as a Presbyterian minister, his last sermon at the age of 104, completely blind and mostly deaf. Rudolph died three days, three days before his 107th birthday. But Uncle Rudolph, was never, ever old. So all this talk of age got me thinking about the church in the world today. After all, it's Pentecost, and we're looking at the church. Is it old and dying? After all, what makes a church old? Is it the age of the building? Is it the people in it? I hear all the time that that church is old. But personally, I don't believe the church is old and dying. If you look at the headlines today and really look at it, that is what you will see, is that the church, especially in America, is dying. Now, personally, I don't believe that. But I do believe that every single church on this planet could benefit from a good old dose and blast of ruach to shake us up and propel us forward. You see, ruah is the emblem of God's divine breath, for it is the Hebrew word for the Holy Spirit. The pronunciation itself sounds like breath because it has to come from your larynx and exhale with a burst of air. Ruah. Try it with me. Ruah. Very good. Ruah is the miracle of life. Ruah is what breathes the life into the church of Jesus Christ. 
And on this Pentecost day, we are celebrating one of the most miraculous and exciting stories in the Bible. For today is the day that the Holy Spirit came down and breathed into the lives of 120 believers as a rush of wind and flames and tongues of fire so that they were empowered to go out and spread the gospel. And they were speaking in all the languages of the world. Today is the day that sparked the movement of reconciliation and of grace and salvation that has lasted over 2,000 years, beginning with 120 people and blossoming to 2.3 billion. How awesome is that? Today is the day come together and just celebrate with wonder and joy and excitement. And why are you all looking at me with those goofy looks on your faces? Like I've totally lost it. Why is the church, are we not more excited about this miracle? Look, we got a lot of people here, but we don't have them out the door like they were at Easter. There's no media blitzes. There's no fanfare for the birthday of the church, which leads me to ask, where is Ruah in the church in the world today? Furthermore, why are we as Christians allowing the headlines to proclaim that the church is old and dying? Have we become so content with just living life the way things are? Or are we afraid to be bold in our faith and see what the Holy Spirit really can do? Personally, I think it's the latter of the two statements. And I believe we need to go back and have a good history lesson on the power of Ruach so that we as Christians in the world can take the church to a new level. The way I see it, the dynamics turn of that day turn Jesus' followers into the body of Christ through wind, fire, prayer, praise, and proclamation. That's what the gift of the Holy Spirit did. Think about it. They're in an upper room. Before Jesus died, he said, I want you to wait and I want you to pray together. Do not leave Jerusalem until I give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. They come every day to pray, but it's now been 42 days and they have no clue when the Spirit's going to come, how the Spirit's going to come or what is it like. So on that day while they're praying, a wind begins to stir in the room and it starts quiet and gentle at first and it grows stronger and it grows stronger and I can just picture them they're all praying their heads are down don't you know what they do they're human they'd be looking at each other wondering what's going on and then the wind picks up with such a rushing force that it rumbles like the thunder that we made in the children's sermon now remember these people have heard the ancient stories of God's breath and God's wind, but now it is an actual tangible reality that they can feel. Now the wind is blowing and rushing with such irresistible force. It's so strong they feel it enter their soul, bursting out the cobwebs of fear and layered dust of uncertainty. And simultaneously, the outward presence of the wind has rushed into every ounce of their physical being, filling them with new thought and faith and courage. Through Ruach, God's breath is being stirred up, enlivened, and empowered back to life from these scared people. The very breath of God has become alive in them. If the wind isn't enough, then divided tongues of fire start coming down and touch them, bringing reality to John the Baptist's words of, I baptize you with water, but one who is greater is going to come and baptize you with the Spirit. I mean, just think of not only the fear they were going through, 
but the exhilaration of what that must have felt like to have flames touch their brains, their lips, their inner souls, and set them on fire inside, but yet there was no injury or pain. This, my friends, is what we call a ruach baptism. For the flames reached inside their very souls and burned off all the dross of guilt and fear and anger and anxiety and revealed pristine metal of discipleship. The fear of Christ's persecution and death has now been doused and the lost feeling has vanished. And in its place comes new and glorious fire within each and every one of them that set their souls on fire for Jesus. And it is this fierce burning in their souls that led the people of Pentecost into even more praise and more prayer and proclamation. And they learned that all these things go together. When they go together, they bring life. First, they had been praying to Jesus for 42 days to the coming of the Spirit emblazoned and released their lips for praise. And that praise became proclamation. And we went from a simple gathering into the living, breathing body of Jesus Christ. And even more, the sound of that wind, if you think about how loud it would have had to have been, made the people outside curious and they wanted to come and see what was happening so peter had a ready congregation for his first sermon and on that day while they were listening the spirit came to them and invaded every faculty of their physical bodies and spiritual consciousness and made them alive for jesus that day three thousand 120 people claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Every tissue of every brain and every heart was ingrained with chruach. And they went out to proclaim to the world, each in their native language, what had happened. Now this week, as I was thinking about what to talk about, I just happened to find an amazing Pentecost story, modern Pentecost story, about two pastors named Jim and Bill. And Jim and Bill were best friends, and they decided they wanted to start a church. They had nothing but ruah pulsing through their veins. No larger church, no money, just a whole lot of ruah. So what they did was they got together with their families and friends every single solitary day. And they prayed together. They studied and they brainstormed ideas for a new church, much like the believers at the Pentecost. The primary question they explored was, how do we reach people God has placed around us with love and compassion and the eternity-altering good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their motto for this infant church was, we don't exist for us. We exist for them. Everyone knew that they were completely dependent on God for this church to be born. At the end of every single gathering that they came to, every single day, they held hands and they prayed, God, would you add daily to our numbers those who need you so that we can help them find the truth of who Jesus is? The day came for their first worship service, and they had 31 people. Not a bad showing. But the congregation committed to saying that prayer God, please add daily to our numbers those who need you. By week 13 of their worship services, they had 575 people in worship. They now have over 3,000, and they're two years old. The reason I tell you this is to show you just how alive 
the church is to, in the world today. That when people come together to pray and praise and proclaim Jesus Christ, holding nothing back and daring to be bold in their faith, the Spirit lives as strong in them as it did in the people of the first Pentecost. The only thing dying about the church in the world today is the way people are choosing to think and act within its walls. Could it be that the Spirit is trying to birth a new church in the world today as it has done over and over and over again for you see, there's a difference between death and change. Just because Jesus' church is no longer looking like it did when we were kids or when our grandparents were alive, it doesn't mean we're dying. Lest we forget, and I have to remind myself of this on quite a few occasions, did you know that Jesus' church is not dependent on our own comfort, our own opinion, and our own approval for life? God is a whole lot bigger than that. And God is not given up on us as a church in the world anytime soon. So therefore, as part of the living body of 2.3 billion believers, are we going to sit around and mourn and allow that negativity that we hear every day on the TV or the internet to feed into saying that the church in the world is dying? Are we going to inhale us some ruah and go out and become people of the Pentecost and prove them wrong? So what if on this Pentecost Sunday, every single one of us here, regardless of if you go to this church or another church, what if we pray daily god add to our numbers at grace or wherever you might be and bring us those who need you so you can help us help them find the truth of who they are who jesus is god add to our numbers daily those who need to know you you know what i have no doubt but Jesus is going to answer that prayer if we are sincere and honest and, and breathe in the Ruah with people coming and coming through those doors. How awesome would that be to see that? The question is, are we ready to inhale the Ruah and become Pentecost in the world today? In the name of the Holy Spirit, the sustainer of our lives, let us pray. God of wind, fire, praise, and proclamation, we know your Holy Spirit is wanting and waiting to blow through our lives, to burn out the dross and the anger and the fear and the doubt of our souls and to lead us into new depths of discipleship. Empower us to become people of the Pentecost, praising and proclaiming Jesus' name to a darkened world that needs to be set on fire for you. And Jesus, we're going to start here, right here and right now, by boldly asking you to increase our numbers at grace daily with people who need to know who you are. Bring them through our doors. Let us welcome them and love them in your name. And let us help them grow in faith and empower them to go out and be bold disciples who serve you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.